There are things that happen only in Albuquerque. What are is an interesting thing or things that have mm-hmm. only happened in Albuquerque? Oh, oh golly, there's so many <laughs> of them. Uh, we, uh, we had such fun putting together a list. Uh, I think one of them is uh, that only in Albuquerque, um, along this 15-mile stretch of Central Avenue, do you have the country's longest urban stretch of Route 66. Uh, Not only that, when we talk about Route 66, we're actually talking about a tourist being able to travel that route in four different directions at once. No other town in the United States can can claim that. So uh, there are so many ways that we are different from other Sunbelt cities. I know that you also include things like the Valentine Diner, which people today might know as a police substation in Knob Hill, but that was a chain. So what was unique about it here in Albuquerque? Uh, What was different here is that uh, in the 1940s, you could actually purchase a a Valentine diner for just a couple of thousand bucks and have your own traveling restaurant. It was very easy to set up. It was relatively small. So you could have it towed to a location, put it up on blocks, and run it very easily. And so our Valentine diner actually had, had moved from two different locations before the museum acquired it. And, uh, and the last owners, the Hernandez family, uh, they donated it to the museum in the 80s or 90s. And at that point, uh, we had actually thought about putting it on our grounds and using it as a restaurant. Now we have the Slate Cafe, and APD is using it as a substation. But we still have the interior of it. The, the coolest thing about the, uh, the Little House Cafe is that it was the nation's only Valentine diner that was being run specifically to promote New Mexican food. And so they had a New Mexican special every Friday night and no other Valentine diet. And that was? Yeah. What was their special? Uh, It was uh, New Mexican food, enchiladas, tortillas, uh, uh, pozole, all kinds of great food. Hmm. And so that speaks to both the spirituality and the creativity and the innovativeness of of the people of Albuquerque. The Rio Grande and Tingley Beach are also unique Mm -hmm. features. How how do they play into the you know, but the character of Albuquerque. It's a really great example of how the Albuquerque people are resourceful, and that's one of our, the characteristics that we talk about in only in Albuquerque. So at Tingley Beach, uh, that was actually a swampy area, and so when Spanish settlers arrived, the Europeans arrived, and, uh, and uh, during Juan de Oñate's uh, settlement of New Spain, they, uh, th- they wanted to settle on a high area, in, in this area, and so the Trujillo family settled in an area that was away from what were known as the swamps of Mejia. Uh, Mayor Clyde Tingley took that area of swampy land and converted it into a beach and made it useful and made it recreational for the people of Albuquerque. And I know we've now reopened it, and it's sort of a, a gathering spot, not a swimming hole, but, but a fishing, fishing hole. pond. Yeah, a very popular fishing hole. One. Yeah, yeah. Why did people choose this place to settle? Uh, the the most compelling reason was because of the river because there was arable land here, uh, because we had a bosque where you could get firewood and building elements, because we had the Sandia Mountains where you could also get firewood and find food and materials for shelter. And then also the fact that the Sandia Mountains kind of, believe it or not, serve as a windbreak. And so it actually protects us from, uh, from extreme snow, ice, wind, and especially during the 1400s, 1500s, and into the early 1800s, we had kind of like a little miniature ice age. It was much colder in this region, but on, here on the west side of the Sandias, we really did not suffer those extremes. Talk a little bit about the role of uh, agriculture and the growth of Albuquerque and why they settled in Old Town. Sure, uh, it's such an important thing. Uh, the uh, Old Town was settled on an area of relatively high ground, but with a, a relatively high water table. And so you could grow crops here uh, in the Bosque and along the river terraces. And you could also um, uh, find open areas to be able to farm. And so right from the very beginning, the settlers here relied on growing their own food. And of course, the Pueblos relied on growing their own food, domesticated corn, uh, had various different kinds of crops, as well as the, the indigenous survival foods here. You know, they used so much of the materials that were here to make a town. You know, we, we like to say that so much of what we do is made of dirt. 
<laughs> it's so very true. You know, you've got the beautiful adobe bricks uh, used to build uh, the uh, the buildings of Old Town, and the torrones or the sod blocks that were literally cut out of the banks of the Rio Grande. They really could you could only really build like that mm. near the river areas, and so um, a lot of what Old Town is built of are adobes. Terrones, and then pine and cottonwood uh, from the Bosque and from the mountains. And it isn't really until the arrival of the Santa Fe Trail and the railroad that you begin to see materials like glass and brick and some of these other elements that you see in buildings in Old Town that were rehabbed uh, or, uh, or that were built in the late 1890s and then uh, rehabbed up into the 1950s to 70s. You know, a lot of people have come through here. We've been this sort of trade crossroads. We continue to be with the big eye, uh, including the Confederates during the Civil War and left behind some howitzers, apparently. <laughs> Talk about that. Yeah, they sure did. Yeah, the trails have been used all the way from ancestral footpaths through the Camino Real, the Chihuahua Trail. And a lot of these routes were taken by people, including the Confederates, as they moved up the Rio Grande um, in an in, in effort to take New Mexico and, uh, and expand the Confederate nation. And in doing so, uh, after the, the Civil War battles that, that happened up north at Glorieta Pass and, uh, and Apache Pass, and they retreated back through Albuquerque. And, uh, and using Albuquerque as a staging area, they decided at that point it would probably be better to take their cannons and scuttle them. Mm. And so they buried them deep in a corral in Albuquerque, uh, using the carriages to transport supplies on their retreat back uh, south and over into Texas. And they were dug up and they were displayed years and, later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, captain, the artillery captain Trevenian Teal uh, pointed out the location of the buried cannons to Captain Jack Crawford, who was interested in digging them up for uh, an exposition back east, and they found eight of them. Deb, talk about we had the first home computing system created oh, in Albuquerque? Absolutely, it's such an amazing story. Who would have thought that the, the birth of the home personal computer would have been right here in Albuquerque? And we are talking essentially about the first popular personal home computer, computer the first one that was actually marketable. And that was Ed Roberts, who, uh, who actually came to Albuquerque as, uh, as an engineer and developed what he called the Altair 8800. And, uh, and marketed that. And so as a result, in 1976, Albuquerque actually had the first Altair World Computer Conference. And uh, a lot of other people, uh, Paul Allen and Bill Gates were there uh, uh, promoting their Microsoft uh, software for the system. And it was a really amazing event. And we, we have examples of that computer system at the museum. Why is it important for us now to remember the history of Albuquerque and what was so unique about it? What's unique about it today? What do we learn? You know, there, uh, there are a, a couple of things that we get re really great teaching moments from the history of, uh, of Albuquerque. We learn a lot about who we are. We learn about the people who, who made us who we are and the people who made this place a really great place to live. Uh, we also get personal learning moments. We learn what, uh, what people's hardships were in the past. We learn how we can avoid those hardships as, as a community in the future. Um, and uh, so it, it can be really exciting from a personal point of view to discover these moments in history, you know, to find out that we're not the only ones who, um, who have to be courageous at times. We're not the only ones who have to live through adversary and uh, we find support in the larger group. Thank you so much, Deb, for coming sure. and talking about those. Thank you.